One thing that I wanted to say was the fact that our generation gets so confused a lot of the time about what purpose and destiny are. So many times we're like, okay, I'm going to be a school teacher. Okay, I'm going to be a preacher. Okay, one day I want to be a worship leader. We all have these goals or maybe this thing that's placed inside of our our heart where we're like, man, that's what I want to be. I'm going to eventually be that. But what we don't understand and what we fail to do most of the time is realize that our purpose and our destiny is in every moment of every day. Our purpose and our destiny is in our heart right now. And God is not just going to hand you being a preacher. He's not just going to hand you being a school teacher. He's not just going to hand you being a mother and a father. But he's going he's to begin to prepare you because he wants you to be successful. And any good parent is going to train up their child and only give them as much as they can handle. Does that make sense? So tonight, that's one thing that I wanted to hit off right off the bat was the fact that we get so caught up in where I'm going to end up and we don't really pay attention to the this is where I am today. And if we can win the battle today and if we can be obedient today, we will end up exactly where we're supposed to be. Okay. so the next point um, that I wanted to make um, is we begin to. Uh, we, we begin not to pay attention to our actions. We take for granted the impact of the words we say. We take for granted the impact of what we say. We, we take for granted the, the impact of what we do around people. And this is one thing that I've definitely, um, I, I've definitely learned the past few years just hanging around uh, youth kids, junior high kids, and talking with them, hanging out with them. And whenever you begin to say things or you begin to speak negatively about something or someone, they pick up on that. And what we do is we don't we, we take it for granted just the little actions in our life every day. And and this is where this purpose comes in. This is where this destiny comes in, where we walk it out every day, because we take for granted the little bitty actions in our life, because it can influence not only our life, but many other people's lives. And a lot of times we are willing to gamble who we are. We are willing to gamble our, our salvation. We are willing to gamble with going and hanging out with old dude or old girl. A lot of the times we are willing to gamble a lot of things in our life. But how many people, I know, you know, if you, if you have a kid or if you have a brother and sister, if somebody said, well, you know what, it's not really going to affect you that much, but it's going to affect your younger brother. It's going to affect your sister. It's going to affect your baby. It's going to affect your child. We begin to stand back and be like, man, I can't do that. You know what, if, if, if. Part of me's on the line, that's one thing. But if I'm putting someone else on the line, that's another thing. And what I wanted to remind us of tonight, our actions are so impactful to others. Being disobedient in certain little things, it, it, it puts others people's, other people's blood on our hands. Because we have a purpose to reach people every day. Not just one day whenever you're a preacher or you're a worship leader or something like that. But we have a purpose today. And... Um, I wanted to flip to a story, so if you do have your Bibles, go ahead and flip to Genesis chapter 27, 18, verses 18 through 23, and what I wanted to talk about just a moment is the fact that a lot of the time, our purpose and what we're doing and what we feel like we're supposed to be doing, we act out of emotion instead of what the Word of God says or what we, or what we know that God told us, and um, just little situations throughout your day. You know, whatever it may be, praying for somebody, spending extra time in the Word, spending extra time worshiping. And what we begin to do is we begin to base really our salvation off of our emotion. And if we're emotionally good and we're emotionally happy, then salvation is good and salvation is happy. When in reality, our salvation should always be good and our salvation should always be happy. Therefore, our emotions should be a secondary consequence of first our salvation. Okay, so I want everybody to kind of pick up on that. I'm going to preface this, this, this story in Genesis. How many people have ever heard of Jacob and Esau? Jacob and Esau, it is like an old school story. I remember listening and learning about this whenever I was like in kindergarten. But anyway, back in the day in the Old Testament, when a man blesses his younger son, it is a big deal. It is a really big deal. It's not like today where you just have some kids and whenever you pass away, maybe you get a little money, maybe a bass boat, something like that. This is like everything that this guy has worked for his entire life. A lot of the things that the Lord has given him, he puts into his oldest son. He blesses his oldest son. And this story is about Isaac, Jacob and Esau's father, blessing 
uh, Esau, okay? So he was supposed to bless Esau. Esau was the older of the two sons. Um, uh, let, me, let me think. Esau's father, Isaac, is on his deathbed. He has cataracts. He can't see, and he calls Esau into his room, and he says, okay, look, um, you know, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be living. I want you to go out. I want you to hunt. I want you to kill something, bring it home, cook it, prepare it for me, and then I'm going to bless you. Okay, so this was this was a big deal. This was a really big deal. Esau's like, okay, so he goes out. He's hunting. While he's hunting, his mother Rebecca says, okay, she goes over to Jacob and says, well, your father is about to bless Esau. Your father is about to bless Esau. She talks Jacob into stealing the blessing that his father was trying to give to Esau. So this is like a, I mean, like a really punk move, like punk moves of all punk moves. Jacob pulls it on his brother Esau while he's out trying to get food for his father. So Jacob is kind of a, a smooth mama's boy, honestly. That's kind of how I feel out of this whole story. But earlier in the thing, he says, but I'm smooth. Esau is like this big hairy joker, okay? He's this big old dude. He's like a man's man. He's going out in the field. He's like killing stuff. He's bringing it back. And Jacob says that to Rebecca. He says, well, look, my skin's smooth. All this stuff uh, you know, da Dad's not going to believe me. Isaac is not going to believe whenever I go in there. What if he makes me draw close to him and he can touch my skin? He's going to know that it's not Esau because it's not hairy. So Rebecca comes up with this idea. Let's put some goat skin on your hands and on your arms so whenever you go in there, he can't see you, but he can touch you. He can feel you. And whenever he feels you, he's going to know that it's Esau. And, dude, my whole thought is, like, goat hair? Like, does anybody know any any guy that's, like, as hairy as goat hair? Uh Dude, they knew how to grow them back in the day. I don't know. But uh, anyway, so Jacob, he gets all dressed up. He's got the goat skin on his arms and his hands. He walks in there, and this is where we pick up in the story. This is verse 18. If you do have your Bible, he says, So he went to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit it, and eat. Uh, of the game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly? He said, because the Lord your God brought it to me. Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, whatever you are, uh, really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did, uh, he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like the brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. Okay, so this is how he did it. Just like I said, Jacob walked in there, and he's all hairy. He walks up to his father. His father's like, man, for some reason, I just don't feel like you're, you're really Esau. Your voice sounds different. But he draws close. Isaac reaches up, touches his hands, and he said, you know what? Well, I feel like this is Esau, even though I heard a different voice. And so many times we, we, we base our Christianity, we base who we are off of what we feel instead of what we heard. So tonight, what I want to point out is the fact that Esau's entire life after this is completely different. Everybody in his lineage is completely different. Everybody in Jacob's life is completely different. Everybody in Jacob's lineage is completely different because of one, one, one situation that Isaac brought back and he went off of what he felt instead of what he heard. And let me tell you that this changed, I mean, the course of history, this changed so many things because Isaac went off of what he felt instead of what he heard. And tonight, sometimes we get to the point where we're like, you know what, God, I know that you said something. I know that you wanted me to pray. I know that you wanted me to say something to my mom about that. I know that you wanted me to start that ministry. I know that you wanted me to, to say something, to start a Bible study. I know that you wanted me to do all these things. But God, I don't really feel like it. I feel this direction, but you're calling me in that direction. And what we begin to do is we begin to uh, walk. In, uh, I like to say it this way. Sometimes the Lord calls us to go 100 miles an hour to the left. And we say, man, I don't really feel that, so I'm going to go 200 miles an hour to the right to make up for what I didn't do. Does that make sense? So a lot of the time, God will ask us to do something, and instead of doing that very thing, we back up and we say, well, I'm going to read my Bible extra today. Well, today, I'm going to worship a little longer today. Well, now I'm going to witness to somebody at church. Okay, 
It's like, that's not really going to do a whole lot of good. Most of the people here love Jesus. And it's kind of what Kendall was talking about earlier. We begin to walk in a different direction than what God has called us to do. And, and, and the thing is, a lot of the time, He's called us to do a specific thing, and we partially do it, but partial obedience is equal to complete disobedience. And so many times we begin to base what we are off of what we feel instead of what we heard when God told us to start something and we won't start it because we don't feel that way. So tonight, I want you to flip to another scripture. This is a scripture that has really, has really transformed my entire life. And um, it is in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. It's kind of wordy. It says, it's, it's, it's worded really strange. So I want everybody to listen. It says, of how much worse, worse punishment do you suppose he will be brought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? Okay, and this, let me just break it down for you for a second. This seems like, okay, yeah, I get it, I guess. No, we, we don't. And whenever we really begin to think about it, the fact is God, the people who are aware of the grace of God, the people who are aware of what Jesus did on the cross for us, and the people who have been redeemed and sanctified, the, those people who take advantage of the grace of God and walk away in disobedience or partial disobedience, it says heavy are the consequences for that person. And I'm not trying to, to be super harsh, but that scripture is harsh. And what, it, what, what happened in my life is there was little bitty things where I was being disobedient. There was little bitty things that was affecting me instead of affecting someone else. And what I began to do is sacrifice my relationship with God because I didn't feel like he was influencing anyone else. But in reality, God was saying, man, you don't get it. He said, I saved you. You know that I saved you. I healed you. You know that I healed you. You know that I touched you. You know that I pour through you every week. And let me tell you, you're going to take advantage of me. You're going to take advantage of me, and you're going to walk out on me, and you're going to do whatever you want and just take advantage of the grace of God. And what he began to, to say to me is every time I sin, every time I'm a little bit disobedient, what it really is is me putting Jesus up on the cross by myself for that one sin. Is it really worth it? And I'm not saying you should feel terribly awful every time you do something, but, but in reality, a lot of the time, people who have been serving the Lord for a long time, we get immune to this grace. Oh, God loves me, though. Man, God loves me. Yes, He does. He loves you more than anything, but whenever we begin to take advantage of the grace of God, heavier the consequences on your soul, and I'm here to warn you tonight. I'm here to warn you tonight. One of the last little stories that I wanted to go over is in John chapter 2. Uh, is really the, the meat of it. it's in verse 4 and 5 and 10. But it, it's the story, it's a really familiar story where Jesus turns water into wine. And I want to kind of set this up a little bit. So many people in here are called to do something daily. So many people in here are called to do something with their life. And what we have to do is realize what that is in every little instance. We have to realize what that is in the long-term plan, and we have to run for it. And you know what? Sometimes people have to push you into that. I was one of those people. There's a few people here that, that know whenever I started leading worship, someone made me. Someone made me get up there and sing. Someone made me get up there and play guitar. And now that's what, I'm, that's what I do for a living. That's how, that's how I, I make money. I, I, I work here. I, I lead worship, and I love the Lord. And it's an awesome opportunity. But let me tell you, someone pushed me into it. And that's not always a good thing, but sometimes it is. And Jesus turning water into wine was an initiation, and this started so many things. And let me tell you that Jesus, of all people, he was at this party. It was a wedding, and his mom came up to him and was like, okay, we're out of wine. He was like, okay, what does that have to do with me? And she was like, okay, uh, well, he said, my time has not yet come. And she was like, all right, everybody listen to him. Whatever he says, do, just do it. And she walks off. So she, like, put the pressure on. I don't know about y'all and how y'all's moms are, but when mama says something, you do it, okay? So Jesus was standing there. His mom told him to do something. And let me tell you, he, you know, the whole story. He turned the water into wine. They filled the vats up, all this stuff. But the part of the story that I want to bring out to you is the fact that his wine was better than all the other wine before. 
And there are people in, in this room that says, well, I can never meet up to the standard. I can never lead worship. I can never preach like they do. I can never do this, 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 and this. But let me tell you, if you would push yourself and you would go into it and you would initiate something in your life and you would begin to, 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 to walk out purpose in your life every day, what you possess inside of you is much greater and much better than anything that's before you. But we have to believe that. Everybody, we can shake our head and, and agree and be like, yeah, yeah, I feel that. And then we can walk out and never start anything. That's what's wrong with our generation. And Kendall hit it right on the head, the fact that, that we're so selfish with this Christianity. Back in the day, man, if you were saved, everybody knew you were saved. Everybody knew you were saved. You were too saved. You talked about it all the time. I got on everybody's nerves. But let me tell you, that's not even a bad thing. But let me tell you that there, there is something inside of you. There is a purpose inside of you that is better than your predecessors. There's a purpose inside of you. There's ministry inside of you. There's people's hearts and lives at stake inside of you. And it's dependent on us taking advantage of what God has put inside of our heart to stand up and say, man, I'm ready. I'm ready to initiate something in my life. I'm ready to step up and, and, and clear this blood off my hands and speak to the people that I'm supposed to speak to. I'm sick and tired of taking advantage of the grace of God, and I realize the consequences. Tonight, just like Kendall said, tonight can be the night in your life and in your heart where God initiates something inside of you that you didn't even realize was inside of you. God, God can come and he can, he can filter out all the bad stuff. He can put stuff inside of you. He can literally give you a voice. Let me tell you, I couldn't sing at all, at all. And I'm not that great now, but let me tell you, Pastor Mike came to me and he, he prayed for me. He said, you want a better voice, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do. And he prayed for me, and I sounded completely different from that day. God can touch you tonight. You can be a worship leader. You can be a recording artist. You can be a preacher. You can be the best mother that ever walked the face of the planet. Let me tell you, grab hold of your purpose. It's today.